Okay, then good evening and welcome to today's talk at the Institute of Comparative Culture at Sofia University, or at least in theory at Sofia University, although of course nobody of us is actually at Sofia University, obviously. Um, since uh, the beginning of this year, we didn't have really any uh, live events, uh, but we are happy that we have been successful with switching to online talks like these, like many other institutions as well in recent months. So welcome to today's event and thanks for tuning in. Um, today we will have um, a talk by Eric Heusler who is a, a research fellow at the Institute of Comparative Culture at uh, the moment. He's also a postdoctoral researcher and has a research project going on in Switzerland about the urbanization of Tokyo, New York and Zurich in comparison. Today he's going to talk mainly about the Japan part of his research. And the title is A World City in the Making, the Urbanization of Tokyo in the 1960s. So welcome, Eric, and thank you. Uh, just a few words about uh, today's procedure. So we will have Eric's uh, talk. Um, then, uh, uh, as I said, we are going to um, record this and I'm going to mute everybody else for the time being. Eric has a PowerPoint presentation and will share his screen with us and with you. Um, we will after that have uh, plenty of time for Q&A so if you have um, questions you can ask them afterwards and um, officially this event is scheduled to end at 7.30 which of course in the virtual world of Zoom is not um, that important really so if there are more questions or if some of you just want to hang around for more informal socializing or chatting that is fine um, as well. Normally if we have that in one of the buildings that you can see behind me of Sophia's campus we would leave in a small group and go out for drinks. I suppose we can have a couple of drinks if you want to grab a beer at 7.30. We can still chat online as well. Um, yeah, so that would be the procedure. So um, enough uh, for me. Oh, by the way, my name is Sven Sala and I'm a professor of modern Japanese history at Sofia University. And um, yeah, as you have noticed by now, I suppose I'm the chair of today's session. So enough talk from my side. Uh, thank you again, Eric, for coming. Please, without further ado, you may start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Sven. Okay, and full screen. Okay, um, so thank you very much again, Sven, for the kind introduction. And um, thank you also to the Institute of Comparative Culture at Sofia University for hosting me and also for allowing me this chance to now uh, present my research online via Zoom. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to any feedback. Um, I arrived in Tokyo on March 13th, Friday 13th of this year. And yeah, was probably on one of the last planes before the pandemic really started. So I haven't had as much chances uh, to, uh, to exchange ideas, receive feedback, talk to people as perhaps I hoped for. So this really is a great chance for me. Thank you for that. Then without further ado, um, today I will talk about a world city in the making, the urbanization of Tokyo in the 1960s. And um, by that, what I don't want to do is to explain why um, nowadays in the 21st century, Tokyo can be described as a world city or a global city. And it always ranks very high in these uh, wonderful uh, rankings of, of worldwide cities. Um, I don't want to explain the path, so to speak, to today's situation, but instead of that, I want to go back and look at the 1960s when it was un unclear how Tokyo actually would develop. What I would like to talk about are these three parts, and um, it should take me just about 45 minutes. Um, First, conceptually, I will talk a little about um, 
how the future matters, um, how social sciences look at the future, and also then a second part, um, why it's interesting to study the future from a historical perspective. The second part um, is my empirical part. There I would like to basically present some of the, what I call past futures of Tokyo in the 1960s that I encountered um, so far and share these with you. And the third and finishing part, um, kind of concluding, will be in regards to kind of methodological and historiographical consequences of my approach and like kind of an outlook of why I hope my, my approach can be interesting and, and productive. Before I totally begin, um, to illustrate my point, um, here um, we see the Imperial Palace Garden on the left. And in 1959, the um, influential economist, Hioe Ouchi, um, he had an interesting idea. He suggested, um, let's open the Imperial Palace Garden to traffic. And um, he thought this idea to have the Imperial Palace Garden only open to the, to the royal family was really undemocratic and unmodern. Um, he used his uh, statistical uh, knowledge um, to calculate kind of the, the daily nuisance of this close off uh, palace garden. And he estimated that one ninth of Tokyo's population had to undergo a daily detour because of the palace. Um, if they were to take a, a taxi to reach their goal faster, he estimated that the yearly annual costs to be around 10 billion yen. On the other hand, if uh, everybody would walk, um, the detours um, would amount to around 78,000 man hours. That's what he concluded. And on the right, we can see as an example, um, if we arrive at Tokyo Station and then want to go actually to Yotsuya Campus, uh, even today, uh, the Chuo line, um, we can see it makes a pretty big detour. It's not a straight line, but it has to go to the north first. So it takes a little longer. Um, what do I want to illustrate by this? Um, it, it's not meant as a counterfactual or alternative history, but um, I think all of us who've been in Tokyo and, for example, run ran around the, the palace um, feel like it's it's very natural. It just feels like this is the way it perhaps always was, and this is the way it always has been. But o Uchi at least suggested um, in 95 that it could be different. And he also later, he, he was affiliated with the later governor of Tokyo, uh, Ryokichi Minobe. So he wasn't totally out of the loop. Um, then to really start with part one, um, here we see a picture of the new Otani Hotel. It's right next to Yotsuya campus, and it's one of several um, luxury hotels that were built in the first half of the 1960s in um, expectation of many thousands visitors for the Tokyo Olympics of 1964, but also um, beyond that, um, it kind of is representative of one form of perhaps economic imagined future. So um, the future matters, um, in which sense? Um, how do mm, the social sciences talk about the future? Um, I would say the main reference point still is the German historian Reinhard Koselleck, who in the 19, uh, 1970s wrote um, an influential work and his main distinction was between experience and expectation and he um, um, introduced the idea that actually also for historical actors um, expectations are important in shaping their, their actions and could also be interesting to look at um, by social sciences. At the same time he also proposed that um, the, the relationship between experience and expectation was ever-changing. Um, one can say notions of temporality were part of the social construction of reality or still are part of this. And um, for Kozilek and other historians, it was very interesting to 
see if um, with the emergence of bourgeois society, actually this, this temporal orientation changed and it became, it leaned more towards an open future, perhaps starting in the 18th century. That's not interesting for me, but I agree that uh, notions of time and temporality certainly are socially constructed. Then um, one can also um, uh, look into another uh, current work, actually. The future as a, as a concept has been, I think, becoming more and more relevant again, perhaps in the last five to 10 years. And um, one of the seminal works is uh, the, the sociologist uh, Jens Beckert's work on imagined futures. And he um, introduces the idea that uncertainty, fundamental uncertainty um, should be the vantage point. Um, um, situations that, that actors and collective actors encounter where the, the future opportunities and risks can't be calculated percentage wise. It's not a risk calculation, but actually it's really fundamentally unclear, uncertain how the future will unfold. And in these situations, it's um, very interesting, I believe, to ask how do uh, people then actually, um, how are they able to act? And then um, Beckert um, suggests that imaginaries and fictional expectations of the future, they actually frame um, situations and enable decision-making. A third aspect, is that um, now um, maybe in the course of modernity and globalization um, in the 20th century, basically worldwide um, imagining future possibilities have become part of the everyday mental work of ordinary people. So it's not just great thinkers, philosophers, statesmen, politicians that, that have this um, capability and or necessity to imagine the future, but actually more or less um, every, everybody um, nowadays can imagine future possibilities. Mm, then um, the, the question between the different temporal dimensions is a difficult one, I believe. How do past, present and future relate to each other? And for me, it's productive to look at the future as temporal horizon of the present. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, the, the future will basically never actually be, be felt. Um, uh, it often, many historians um, that look at uh, public history and um, memorials, for example, like uh, Svendas, um, they do a great job at looking at which role past imaginations or um, political usages of the past, for example, play for present discussion. But um, it's also very interesting to ask how the future shapes the present. And for me, in any temporal direction, the present actually is the, the decisive dimension. Mm. Now, basically, I've talked about the future in social sciences. Um, and what's very interesting for my project is that I try to turn uh, from the present future and turn it into past futures. So I'm really interested in, as I already said, looking at ideas of urbanization in Tokyo in the 1960s with a very open mind. How did different actors imagine the future in this, uh, is in this turbulent era. And so then um, my idea is to go further with um, a historical analysis of imagined and yet to come futures actually. And here are a few references that are very important to me. I mentioned some of them already. Um, I can still highly recommend Kozelek um, who wrote in the 1970s um, Jens Beckert's work is also interesting. His, his main question really is um, what, what explains the capitalist dynamic? Um, 
in the last 200 years? How can we explain the global success and also the failure and the crises um, of, of capitalism? And um, that's an interesting piece of work for me. Um, I would also quote, quote Ayun Apadurai, who's a little more interested in the, the cultural um, element of imagined futures and questions of um, identity and politics. And um, last but not least here, um, Niklas Luhmann in the 70s wrote a very interesting essay, The Future Cannot Begin. And he really states that the, the present is the, the, the arena where past as well as future ideas are, are formed and then also discussed. Okay, then um, after this brief overview of the future and social sciences, how am I trying to use past futures as a concept um, for my project? Um, kind of surprisingly, perhaps, and counterintuitive, questions of temporality actually are not historians' strong suit, um, I would say. Um, and um, I'm not the only one there recently, um, Many historians have mentioned this, and I, I feel that sometimes, um, even with all the, the turns and historiography, definitely has changed. But in regards to how can we look at past futures, um, we may have even fallen behind to some of the, the works I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, so it's kind of still a, a work in progress, and there's no clear method of how to study past futures as a historian. That's one part of my, my research project that I'm trying to, to grapple with. Then um, I would like to analyze Tokyo's past futures as a historical blend um, to lend that term from uh, Carol Gluck. Um, and that's very important that one looks at various protagonists. Um, um, I think it's, it's important to have an open um, experimental design basically and see who talked about the future in which ways, which media did they use um, and include as many protagonists as possible basically, especially in an, in, in an initial phase where I'm kind of collecting past futures. Then um, these um, various protagonists also have different constraints, um, a spelling error. And so it's not that I wanna say the future is everything and only the future decides it's totally free from any past uh, developments and constraints. But I would say um, the, that history matters, but the future uh, matters just as much. And um, at any given moment in time, most likely there's actually a wide spectrum of available futures in, in the plural. So um, it's not one future for Tokyo that becomes hegemonic and then that's um, fulfilled, but it's more of a, of a blend um, of old ideas, new ideas, um, ideas from all over the world that then are put uh, into effect or up, up for debate by various actors. And what emerges out of this uh, combination isn't clear in advance and is something new. It's not old, it's not uh, Japanese or Western, it's something emergent new, I would suggest. And then for me right now, um, the case studies that I am interested in basically are um, situated between bureaucracy and science fiction. And so um, by that, I mean any imagined future that's an easily executed plan um, isn't interesting for me. That's the one extreme. And the other extreme as science fiction that is just really very loosely uh, based in, in reality and also where the, the authors basically don't have the idea to influence um, societal developments, at least not immediately. And they also aren't confronted with other ideas as a stakeholders. So I'm interested in case studies between those two extremes. And my aim is to include um, diverse actors and also use 
a variety of sources to kind of try and um, get a grasp on the, the multitude of past futures in Tokyo in the 1960s. Then um, the last point that's really interesting for me here um, and important is we've spoken with Luhmann, um, the future cannot begin. Um, I do find myself uh, very often also still kind of falling into the trap of looking at um, what happened to Tokyo, what happened to the case studies I, I'm analyzing now, and then kind of retrospectively uh, looking for explanations and the one right path. And I think that's at least for me now in this project, not the way I want to pursue. Um, I, I believe um, it's very interesting to look at the, the historical moment where actually the outcome of the event wasn't predictable. So I'm kind of radically trying to start um, almost January 1st, 1960, and then with an open mind, look how was future, how were futures imagined? And I prefer this to a hindsight bias and um, causal explanations. Here, um, interesting references are Vanessa Ogle, who um, um, more generally wrote an interesting article on time and temporality in the history of capitalism. And there she gives a good overview of um, how in the past historians have uh, looked at the future, but also suggests um, further productive combinations with um, maybe more current um, research questions. And the second one is Carl Gluck, um, her concept of um, historical blend or blended modernities is really fascinating to me. And I can uh, just really recommend this article or essay from 2011 to anybody that's interested in um, conceptual history and how um, empirical knowledge can kind of be put into a more abstract theoretical framework. Then um, what do I want to do actually in combining the past futures and urbanization? My idea really is to ask how did past futures influence urbanization? Um, how were, were cities shaped by these past futures? And so that's a different topic, um, different interest than, for example, Kozelek with his a uh, new open future um, beginning with modernity or bourgeois society. It's also a different focus as opposed to um, Jens Beckert and his searching for reasons for capitalist dynamics. And as I stated, um, historians aren't that well equipped actually to deal with the historical analysis of past futures. So I think it's very important to use an interdisciplinary approach, um, use concepts from urban studies, um, from sociology, anthropology, and then um, combine that with a really open-minded historical analysis that tries to get as close as possible to historical actors and their past futures. And as Sven already uh, mentioned in the introduction, my project, my postdoc project is thought as a, um, com in a comparative perspective. I would like to look at the urbanization processes in Tokyo, New York City and Zurich in the 1960s. And I believe that the combination of past futures and urbanization um, is fruitful for two reasons. Um, one would be that um, in the second half of the, the 20th century, um, one, one could describe the, the global development developments kind of as urban age. So many of the dynamic aspects of capitalism, um, big success and economic growth, but also kind of the flip side of that coin, um, those occurred in, in cities, in urban areas, in metropolises. Um, and to ask them, did past futures play a role there, that could be interesting. And I also believe that a city of uh, like Tokyo, for example, isn't a clear entity. Um, and so using the, this idea of open futures in the plural could also be well suited for 
um, looking at what actually cities are, uh, how urbanization unfolds. And yeah, here we see an aerial view of these three cities and I will now then go over to part two and share a few of the past futures that I encountered um, in Tokyo in the 1960s with you. So here, part two is next. Um, a historical blend, the past futures of Tokyo in the 1960s. Um, and basically my idea is to, to show a few um, in, in question form, how did historical actors imagine Tokyo's future? So perhaps it was imagined as a designed city. And here on the left, um, we see the famous architect Kenzo Tange uh, standing in front of a model of his uh, plan for Tokyo, 1960. And um, his idea was that with the advent of the automobile or, or more and more um, individual mobility being capable uh, with by car, um, he thought this would really uh, change the the structure and demands of um, urban areas. And he had a radical mega structure idea to introduce a new spatial order into Tokyo. He, his idea was to use the, the space, kind of the empty space over Tokyo Harbor and install offices and um, living space and um, transportation accesses over Tokyo Harbor. Um, and then on the right, um, another contemporary of Tange, the architect Fumi Hikomaki, who also was part of the so-called metabolist um, uh, architectural group. He had a distinctly different approach and a different idea. Um, here in the picture, we see the Hillside Terrace project in Daikanyama. Um, and it was conceived by Maki to actually be built um, over um, more than 20 years and unfold in seven stages. And here his idea was that um, one could kind of guess that the demands of citizens would change, um, technological means would evolve. And so on purpose, he um, employed a flexible open um, process of building this uh, hillside terrace. Then um, kind of in post-war Tokyo, also several actors um, developed uh, ideas towards Tokyo as an international city. And here on the right, uh, on the left, sorry, um, on the left we see the more or less catchy slogan, uh, quote, Tokyo Adventure, easy as B-O-A-C. Um, and this is an advertisement in the New York Times in 1960 by the predecessor of today's British Airways, where they advertise um, their Rolls Royce jets um, making travel easy from New York to Tokyo. Two pictures further on the right, also 1960 in the New York Times, um, Tokyo is introduced to New York. Tokyo meet New York. Um, in 1960, New York became the first um, sister city of Tokyo. Um, and to this date, it's the first of 12 sister cities that Tokyo has. And um, also kind of the beginning of, of ideas going towards international cooperation, not on the national uh, state level, but um, cooperation between various cities. Um, the, the later governor, Ryokichi Minobe, also took this idea several steps further and in, uh, towards the end of the 1960s actually planned an urban summit. Um, uh, its later name was the, the Conference of Great World Cities. It actually took place in Tokyo, I believe in 1970. Um, and this was even more than the idea to actually let different cities exchange ideas, um, cooperate, and also cooperate, for example, beyond the, the Cold War and beyond um, international divisions. Another question that was raised by contemporaries was 
um, is Tokyo a modern city or should it be a modern city? And if yes, in which way? Um, here on the top left, an article in the Washington Post from 1964 um, mentions that actually the, the city officials uh, used the occasion of the October Olympics in 1964 kind of as an excuse for modernization. And this um, perspective was definitely shared by many um, Tokyo's and many uh, contemporaries on the bottom left. We see a still from the official documentary movie of the 1964 Olympics. And um, it's around two hours long. And at the very beginning, um, in minute two, um, the, the director um, installed this um, the scene where a wrecking ball destroys um, old buildings and old parts of Tokyo in order to build um, the new supposedly modern um, infrastructure for the upcoming Olympics. And on the bottom right, um, we see uh, uh, an art uh, installation by the Art Collective High Red Center from 1964. And here was a kind of, in an ironic, sarcastic way, they, they dressed up and um, cleaned the streets of, of Ginza um, to prepare uh, for all the international guests that were coming, that were expected to come to Tokyo for the Olympics. And they even went so far to hand out um, flyers um, with uh, fake names of, of companies that supposedly um, finance this, this cleaning um, activity. Then more and more um, over the course of the 1960s also um, critical questions were raised, um, is Tokyo a livable city? Um, here on the left, um, the New York Times article already pretty early in 1961 suggests, quote, um, Tokyo waging a losing battle against choking on its own growth. Um, so the, the amazing economic and um, demographic growth that also was a, a national priority from the, the central government in Japan um, kind of showed more and more side effects that limited the life quality of Tokyo citizens in the 60s. Um, bad air um, um, induced asthma um, and here the, the third picture from the left we can see um, Tokyo afternoon actually in 1964. And even though it's a black and white picture, we can see that um, smog is, is pretty heavy and smog really was a big problem for the city. Um, all this also leads to another interesting question um, that contemporaries probably asked, um, a city for whom? Who, who does Tokyo belong, for, belong to? Who um, should shape um, its future? And uh, here in 1967, um, in a big surprise to everybody, including himself, um, Ryokichi Minobe, um, um, supported by socialists and um, communist parties actually won the, the election to become uh, the governor of Tokyo. Um, the New York Times called him the housewives champion and um, they are referencing his TV show. Um, uh, before he became a governor, he had a, a TV show where he uh, talked about everyday problems of, of urban life um, in, a, in a fake um, uh, household with with um, actors that acted as um, um, citizens and then talked about various problems that they encountered while living in Tokyo. And Minobe um, really won this victory um, by using a, a platform of change, one might call it. Um, he really pointed out that um, Tokyo in the second half of the 60s had many, many problems. Um, the, the economic growth and gains of the post-war success were ensured evenly among enough um, people. Uh, there was pollution um, and he, he introduced, for example, the idea of a civic minimum uh, or civic minima where um, the, the access to uh, green zones, um, a minimum per citizen 
was installed um, and he also uh, began to to communicate pretty actively on the on the top right um, we see two publications um, that he um, organized um, they're part of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government's Municipal Library um, and in 1969, he published or in the series Sizing Up Tokyo was published and then 72 Tokyo for the People. And here he really tried to communicate his ideas um, with a wide audience and introduce um, a new way of administrating Tokyo, um, more local administration as opposed to the, the central government and also more of a participation, uh, participatory way. And of course, also, I didn't mention it too much in this talk yet, but on the bottom right, we see um, violent protesters and students who who are uh, protesting the development of the uh, new um, Tokyo International Airport to today's Narita. So um, all these different futures really were heavily contested and also um, led to violent outbursts and heavy um, discussions in the 1960s. Um, another interesting perspective is um, what I showed here, these, these few um, past futures. Um, could they maybe be described and brought together as a world city in the making? Um, already in 1963, on the left, uh, in a Washington Post um, advertisement, actually, the then um, governor, the predecessor to Ryokichi Minobe, um, Ryotaro Asuma, um, he proudly presents, this is Tokyo, 1963. Um, and he introduces Japan's booming capital to basically um, a global audience, or at least the, the uh, readership of the Washington Post. And in a very, in a similar way of communicating, um, in the New York Times in 1968, um, the, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government itself actually acted as the advertiser and um, they um, also confidently communicated Tokyo, the world's greatest heartbeat. And um, below in the description of Tokyo, they actually highlight the great job that the, the TMG, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government is doing. And here it's not so clear what, what product they're actually selling, um, but I would say it's an overarching argument um, to show that Tokyo in the, in the 60s is interesting for a variety of, of people, business interests, tourists, um, national and international guests. So this could be the beginning of um, the later Tokyo uh, world city perspective. Um, basically with this overview, my goal was to show that uh, a multitude of past futures existed in, in Tokyo um, in the 1960s. And um, one could, for example, uh, describe them as Tokyo's megastructure, um, or perhaps Tokyo more of a, as a flexible city, as an ecological metropolis, as a world city, um, or I didn't talk too much about these aspects, but Tokyo as a consumer's paradise, as a city of unrest, as a political trendsetter, and probably also many more. And I'm still in the stage of basically collecting these, these past futures and developing various case studies um, to build my project. Then um, over to part three, um, and by way of a conclusion, basically, um, I would like to talk about the metaphor of roads not taken and uh, introduce what, um, for me, my, my approach and perspective could develop into, could develop into something that right now I call histories of the possible. So what do I mean with that, by that? Um, I think that um, I was able to show that the future, future of Tokyo's urban space was, and at the same time also is, uncertain and open and produced, um, produced meaning socially constructed. 
and um, this openness um, to me um, is is related to imagined futures because um, the the idea how imagined futures actually succeed um, it's not a question of of more knowledge um, of more data of actually anticipating um, the future but more questions of of narrative of um, interesting stories, good storytelling, of course, also of power, and and it's always a struggle, and always mm, there's always the existence of multiple futures. Um, I would like to actually, at the same time, also highlight the impact of the roads not taken, um, because I believe um, no matter if there were. Uh, successful or not, they actually generated new realities and showed that a different future was possible. So my goal is to treat um, um, past futures of Tokyo's urbanization um, the same, and no matter if they actually were realized or not, in this stage where uh, imagined futures are, are developed and then also communicated and discussed and debated, I think it's very beneficial to actually open um, the, the number of um, and also diversity uh, of, of past futures. And then um, I, I hope that kind of from a historiographical standpoint, um, this could change how we talk about cities past, present and future. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, um, as I already mentioned, I think it's difficult um, for historians, definitely for me personally, to look at past, past um, developments without hindsight bias, um, kind of blending out the, the result and trying to, to not give a causal explanation, but more of an interpre interpretation and collect possible outcomes. And at, at the later stage when uh, we talk about cities and then the different temporal dimensions are combined. So uh, talking about Tokyo's uh, past future under the, the communist uh, governor, Ryokichi Minobe in the 1960s, if that's used to explain the present or even more difficult, um, talk about what, what the future should be for Tokyo, perhaps even in a normative way. I think there, there's a, big danger of kind of compounding um, mistakes of interpretation of what is actually compared um, um, and, and why did actually one, one past um, development, why was it successful? Analogies between past, present and future, there um, I think it's really dangerous. So I would like to introduce, introduce a little more complexity perhaps also into today's um, discussions about urbanization. Yep. And um, here I would like to recommend these two authors. Um, Manu Goswami wrote a fascinating article in 2012. And there she kind of showed that in uh, colonial India, um, um, looking back now, um, many, uh, the, the, the narrative basically is that um, getting out of uh, colonialism, the best way and the only way forward was uh, nation states. And Goswami kind of shows that that's not true in the interwar period. Um, many um, Indian sociologists actually suggested more um, local forms of government. And so that's kind of something that I'm interested in with Tokyo, um, arguing against narratives such as the nation state is the clear way forward in the 20th century. Um, even though um, there were uh, many different options that were as legitimate as the nation state um, early in time. And um, a little more directly related to urbanization and also um, global urban history is Tim Verland's um, new article in an edited volume where he looked at um, the future of Amsterdam city center actually um, and with a similar time frame as mine so I can also recommend that article warmly and then um, I already 
hopefully, yeah, I stayed in, in my time budget more or less. I reached the end, reached the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much for everybody from near and far. Thank you for your attention. And I'm really looking forward and eager to, to hear any questions you might have, feedback, additional ideas, um, and please share them with me now um, during the Q&A or also reach out to me anytime later. Um, easiest way probably is to use my Gmail address. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Eric, for this wonderful talk. Uh, let me stop the recording at this point.